see that our friend David is here this morning. He is going to be celebrating his 45th birthday next weekend, and we're all invited, so make sure you see the poster on your way out today. Uh, it's a, a, a wonderful occasion that we can uh, celebrate. So in anticipation of this morning's sermon topic, I would like you to stick out your tongue. No, really, I'd, I'd like you to stick out your tongue. It can just be for a moment or a couple of seconds. If you want to keep it stuck out for the whole service, that's your <laughs> prerogative. And I know for some of you that makes you feel uncomfortable, strange, seems a little bit weird. Uh, for some of you, it's just not a big deal. And uh, for others, we look at it differently. For some of you who are feeling awkward, you would say the really only legitimate uh, and appropriate place to stick out your tongue is at the doctor's office. And if it would make you feel more comfortable as you stick out your tongue, you can say, ah, um, and, and that might make it easier for you to do. And on the other level of the spectrum are those of you who would say, John, you made my day. For a lifetime, I've wanted to stick out my tongue at the preacher. <laughs> and uh, this morning you have permission, and you're going to be able to get away with it. So anytime during this sermon you have the urge to stick out your tongue, uh, that is a very permissible today. Did you know that in Tibet, it is not only appropriate, but it is necessary to stick out your tongue. It is a form of greeting and a sign of respect. So next time you're in Tibet, remember that this is something that is very legitimate and appropriate. But uh, you would agree with me that in our Western culture, it's usually frowned upon. Sticking, sticking out your tongue can be perceived as rude, um, mocking, taunting, uh, disrespectful, but it's true for some, it's kind of playful and silly. Like you've seen those selfies where someone is sticking out his or her tongue. I don't really get it, but I think people are trying to show their playful side. I, I think it's actually quite silly. Um, but you know, a family photo, you know how it works, right? Uh, someone will say now, you got to smile and be serious for this picture. The next picture will let you be silly. You can make a crazy face. You can stick out your tongue. There's all kinds of options that way. Sticking out your tongue. For some, it's seen as being flirtatious. So after the service, if you're tempted to stick out your tongue in the foyer, be careful who you're sticking out your tongue to, they may misinterpret that particular gesture. There's a lot of exams going on up at Fanshawe Western uh, this month. Did you know that for a lot of people, they stick out their tongue as a way of concentration? And uh, I could tell you that there are many people I've seen do that. And then often for others to distress or to relieve anxiety, they... Uh, stick out their tongue. So there's lots of reasons that we have for sticking out the tongue. Did you know that uh, the tongue is often a barometer of what's going on in other parts of your body? So when it comes to thyroid conditions, when it comes to the potential for a stroke, we could go on and on. The tongue says a whole lot about your physical health. So doctors are interested in looking at the tongue. Uh, dentists have to often deal with your tongue. My dentist and my dental hygienist have told me that I have a very strong tongue. Now, I tell them it's because <clears throat> I work out that muscle regularly, at least once a week. Some of you are saying it's because you talk a lot, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that hanging. And then, of course, there's the whole range of uh, speech pathologists, speech 
therapists, those who work in the area of linguistics. Sometimes with a speech therapist, they need to make an adjustment for someone who's maybe struggling with communication or their speech. Uh, we think of uh, other times where someone who works in the area of linguistics uh, is very concerned about the positioning of the tongue. Have you ever heard some of those African dialects where it involves clicking the tongue? Uh, very common in some parts of Africa. Uh, Mandarin, I'm told, is a very difficult language and it involves some intricate positioning of the tongue. And by the way, if we're talking about foreign languages, what about those who are Scottish? Have you ever noticed that with Scott, watch the way Scottish people talk. They have to, you know, to say an expression like aqua, you have to take your tongue and put it right in the back of your throat. It's kind of like a guttural sound. Ach, well, daddy. So be listening for that, okay? With all our Scottish folks, be listening for that. I talk about Irish and others, but I'll leave that for your discretion. The other day at the Y, there was a whole room full, just off the track, of speech pathologists and speech therapists. Uh, a seminar, I guess, for the morning. Uh, they were talking about talking. But at a break, they decided to have a run. So I thought that's, or a walk. I thought that's interesting. Talking and walking. And uh, nothing quite like having 50 or 60 speech pathologists chasing you down on the uh, track at the Y, but it, it intrigued me, that image, because last week we talked about faith without works is dead. We talked about the walk of faith, and today we're going to shift to looking at the talk of faith, and if our, our works or our Christian walk is a demonstration of authentic faith, then our words uh, demonstrate uh, our, our faithfulness and our commitment to the Lord. The tongue not only is the barometer of physical health, but the way we speak, the words we use, our communication is a barometer into our spiritual health or, or like a window that reveals the condition of our hearts. You'll recall that in James chapter 1, at the end of the chapter, James says, here's what true religion looks like. It involves showing compassion to the poor and needy, like widows and orphans. It involves keeping on the path of holiness. And then the third aspect, which intrigues us, is keeping a tight rein on the tongue. How you speak, speak and how you communicate. So I'd like us now to read our next passage in James, and we're going to look at James 3, 1 through 12. So if you've got your Bible, you can turn to it. And we'll read all 12 verses. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, 
This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Here's my simple outline. James begins with a particular concern. He'll talk about the power of the tongue. In the next section, I'm calling problems, problems, more problems with the tongue or our speech. And then we'll conclude with tips for the tongue or practical tips in terms of the way we speak. So James begins with a particular concern. It, it, it's a warning to teachers, and I must admit, it's a jolt. If you look at the flow of chapter 2 and what you might expect or anticipate, uh, there's a bit of shock value with how James begins chapter 3. It would be like, imagine the first day of teacher's college, and the instructor gets up in front of the group and says, now, wonderful to see you here, but not many of you should be schoolroom teachers. Or at law school, everybody's excited to be into law school, but the first day the instructor gets up and says, you know, not many of you should be lawyers. Or at a Bible college in a preaching class, the instructor says, good to see you here, but not many of you should become preachers. Now, Why is James concerned? Why is he highlighting this particular warning? Well, there was a notion back then, and it still prevails today, that anyone can teach. Uh, Having been married to a school teacher for close to 40 years, having taught myself for well over 40 years, can I say unequivocally that is not true? Uh, The most painful season in my early Christian life was when the church I grew up in, the leaders had the brilliant idea that everyone should have his turn, and notice the pronoun, everyone should have his turn preaching a sermon. So it was kind of like a smorgasbord rotation. And there were some men who had no business being up on the platform. They knew it. And we especially knew it. The notion that anyone can teach is false. And then there's the idea that uh, some have that uh, we, we have what I would call wrong motives. Uh, there's an idea that teaching, especially in a church setting, is prestigious. Or it's the way to accumulate a lot of, of power. In some cases, James might be concerned because uh, some might be just naive. I remember talking to a young fellow when I was instructor an instructor at the Bible college. He came up to me at a break and said, John, I'd really, really like to be a preacher. And I said, that's great. Can you tell me why? He said, well, I figure that I'd like to live an easy life and make a lot of money. And I thought, okay, that's an interesting perspective. And then he added, um, I really like to talk a lot, and I'm told that I'm quite chatty. I thought, wonderful credentials and uh, qualifications for someone who is preaching from God's word. Now, we need to be careful that we don't overvalue the teaching ministry in a church. We should put no one, no one at all, on a pedestal, but we want to also be careful that we don't undervalue this gift. Scripture is very clear that those who teach the Word of God are to be respected, treated with dignity, and honored. But at the same time, James seems to have a greater concern. His particular concern, and the reason for his warning, is that the teacher be it the preacher from the platform, be it the Sunday school teacher, it could be the Bible study leader, will be judged more strictly. Now, verse 2 makes it clear that James has in mind the aspect of, of speaking or talking, and one who teaches 
tends to use a lot of words and does talk a fair bit. Some of the judgment will be unfair because it's coming from others. So there can be scrutinizing, which I think should happen, but over-scrutinizing where it comes to the point of, of nitpicking in evaluating a preacher. Online is wonderful, but one of the dark sides of uh, the online possibility is people can dissect a sermon and get to a point where they're looking at it in a, an unhealthy way. And then, of course, we're dealing these days with sensitivity. There's things I could say 15 or 20 years ago that I have to be very careful given our climate of the day. So we are very aware of some of the challenges in that particular way. And then when it comes to judging, a lot of folks, particularly when it comes to the pastor teacher, have expectations, some that are unrealistic. So someone goes to uh, his pastor and says, uh, I, I think my wife has a thyroid problem. Could you tell us what we should do? Um, I have always regarded myself as a person who's not a medical expert. My line consistently is see your doctor. Isn't that incredible advice? Or someone goes to the pastor and says, we have a big legal issue in our family. Could you give us your perspective, all the intricate in and outs on this matter? Again, I would say you need to see your lawyer. I've had pastor friends who've gotten in a whole lot of trouble because they've weighed in. They've spoken to issues they really don't have the ability to speak to. So we need to be very guarded and very careful. Yeah, we can comment maybe on some of the ethics involved, but we need to know our limitations. A funny story. <clears throat> we had just arrived at Byron. It was one of my first Sundays preaching, and somebody came up to me 10 minutes before the service and said, Pastor John, we have a plumbing issue in the woman's bathroom. I said, yes. Well, what should we do about it? And I thought, oh, you don't know me. Asking me for plumbing advice or electrical advice. Uh, and I had to say to the fellow, I'm sorry, but that's way out of my league just because I have the gift of preaching doesn't mean I'm a plumbing expert. Now, there is some good news. You folks have got to know me. The expectations have lowered, really lowered, and in fact, my guess is some of you would say so low that we have no expectations, John, of you when it comes to anything to do with assembling or putting things together. Now, the flip side is the fair judgment that comes from God. God expects those who handle his word to present the truth, to handle the word accurately, to be wrestling and struggling with the question, what is God wanting to say through this passage or through this text? Am I representing what are the intentions of God in this passage. And we need to regard, whether you're a Sunday school teacher, or a small group leader, or preaching from the platform, it is a serious responsibility. Paul, when he was leaving a particular place, it's recorded in Acts 20, says, I don't have your bloods on my hand. He's saying, in no way did I harm or hurt you through my teaching ministry. And then goes on to say, my endeavor was to preach the whole council of God's word. And Paul's saying, I wasn't picking or choosing. I wasn't saying, I like this passage, and I really don't like that one. The whole counsel of God's word. And that is one of the requirements when it comes to what God expects, his standard, and what we'll be judged on. So there is application here for all of us who preach, all of us who teach Sunday school, all of us who are small group leaders, and I need to say, by way of encouragement, note, the passage does not say no one should become a teacher. It says not many, and there's a difference. So it's not that James is saying, I want to get rid of all teachers. We don't need that gift. It's not important. He recognizes the importance of the gift. But 
This is not only just a warning, but you'll see now it becomes a launching pad for where James wants to go. Because in verse 2, I would argue he broadens the scope. We all stumble in many ways. Yes, I know. Some scholars say that all of James 3, 1 to 12 applies to those who have a teaching ministry. But I believe that James' intent is broader. All of us stumble in many ways. Uh, Anyone who does not or is not at fault in what they say. So he's thinking especially of stumbling or sinning through our words. Uh, Anyone who doesn't have that happen is, is perfect. And I would venture to say that we all have room for improvement and areas that we need to work on when it comes to our speech. So having moved from the particular to the general, James now is going to pump out the illustrations like any good preacher. You like the illustrations, you like the stories. Well, James, I think, was heavily influenced by his brother Jesus because we got an illustration about a horse, about a ship, uh, about a forest fire, uh, a fountain, a uh, fig tree, an olive tree. James is going to t- going to town on his illustration. So he starts in uh, the verses uh, four through five, talking or three through five, talking about the power of the tongue. <clears throat> he talks about how small things can have great impact. So you've got the bit, you've got the horse. The bit is small, but the horse rider using the bit in the horse's mouth can control and dictate the direction of that mighty horse. I'm always fascinated when I see a smaller child riding a horse, uh, equestrian style, marveling at how they can control the movement of that grand horse. And, And James says, and a ship is like that as well. You got that small rudder, but the pilot or the captain of the ship can navigate that ship even through stormy waters as he operates with that little rudder. And then likewise, James says, the tongue is similar. It's small, but it can have great impact. Now, I think in this part of chapter 3, James is being kind of neutral. So we can be positive, and we can think here of what the Proverbs call life words or words of encouragement. And all of us have experienced the power of a kind word, a compassionate word, a word of encouragement. A few days ago, someone called me just to encourage me through his words, and my heart was touched by that kind of encouragement. So you see then in verse 5 that this is a basis for this small part of our body making a great boast. Now, boast can be seen negatively, pride or arrogance. But I I think here James' intent is that the tongue can accomplish great things. And if we circle back to the end part of verse 2, where James says, anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. James used the same idea in chapter 1. So, no, we're not perfect. We'll only be perfect in our heavenly existence. But when it comes to what we strive for, we strive for excellence. We're we're going for the gold. And, And the value of that is the ability to control the tongue trickles over to an ability to control other areas of the body. So the tongue has an impact on our pursuit of holiness. It's the tongue that can tell the mind, uh, don't think that way. Don't convince yourself that you have to sin. Uh, The tongue can communicate with your feet, with your hands, and and say, "You, you need to do that. You need to go there. You need to make that. So the tongue can be a tremendous influence for good. But James, his main thrust in this passage would seem to be negative. The misuse or the mis- or ab- abuse of the tongue or our words, the harmful effects of the tongue. Now, as we read through verse 6 to 12, 
my notion a couple of days as I've looked at this passage is uh, James must have woke up on the wrong side of bed when he wrote verses 6 to 12. Because it's pretty negative. It's pretty harsh when it comes to the abuses and the misuses of the tongue. In in fact, uh, in verse 5, at the end of it, at the start of verse 6, James says the tongue is a fire. Now, interesting, isn't it? He doesn't say the tongue is like a fire. He said the tongue is a fire. Now, there is a bit of a positive aspect when we think of how a spark can start a fire. Uh, At camp, did any of us, like me, saying it only takes a spark to get a fire going? That's how it is with God's love. Once you experience it, you want to pass it on. Hey, I like watching that reality show, Survivor. And you know how in Survivor, it becomes critical that you're able to start a fire with just a small flint, and uh, then at the end of the contest, There is a competition to who can start the fire the quickest and the best uh, using just a a piece of flint. So we see some positive aspects that way. But boy, when we think of forest fires out in Western Canada and in other places, we see the danger of a spark of fire. One of my favorite uh, places to visit is Chicago. And uh, there's so much I love about Chicago, but... In one of my last visits, we were in one of the towers, and it gave a history of the infamous Chicago fire. Do you remember how it's rumored to have started? Mrs. O'Leary's cow uh, hit a, a lantern. That spark started a fire, and the devastation in Chicago was incredible. We think back then, way back then, There were 17,500 buildings destroyed. That's a massive number for back then. 300 people lost their lives. And 125,000 people, significant part of Chicago's population back then, ended up homeless. It only takes a spark to set a fire. And in a negative way, we see that connotation. So in verse 6, which is almost an impossible verse to translate from the Greek. Um, There's been many efforts, and uh, we see that conveyed on the translation that we're using on the screen today. If I was to try to summarize it, paraphrase it, I would say James' point in the first part of verse 6 is that every sort of evil finds an ally, ally in an evil tongue. It's the tongue that in A direct or indirect way gives permission for other parts of the body to sin. And sometimes the sin is a sin of commission or a sin of uh, omission. And then uh, James goes on in verse 6 and talks about how the tongue can um, repeat, it can reinforce, and and it spreads evil just like a, a forest fire. Think of gossip. Think of slander has a way of spreading. It, 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 it's kind of contagious. It just spreads out everywhere. And then James talks about um, how it can defile. Um, it, it can leave a, a stain or a bad odor. I remember one summer in my teenage years, I counseled the whole summer at a Christian camp. Every night we'd have a campfire, and I wore my favorite sweater. By the end of that summer... That sweater smelt like I was a full-time smoker. It had a very heavy odor to it, aired it out, washed it all kinds of times. That sweater always smelled like smoke. And that's kind of how an evil tongue operates. It defiles, it, it soils the whole body. And then we see the coarse of, of, of the evil tongue, the course in life, it establishes a pattern. Often people who struggle with gossip struggle with it for a lifetime or slander or other kinds of sins of, the, of speech. And then the, the source, and this is quite disturbing, James points to an evil source. He talks about hell, 
very specifically the translation is the Hinnon Valley where in that little area outside the walls of Jerusalem back then, it was like a burning garbage dump. And I think that James is reminding us of the evil powers and potentials of hell. A bad tongue, bad speech can be like hell on earth. So the tongue can be very harmful. And the tongue, as James indicates in verse 7, can be uncontrollable. I don't know if James was thinking of a circus or a zoo back in verse 7, but we marvel, don't we, at the way people can train big animals like uh, the elephant at the circus or the lion or the tiger if you go to an aquarium, the dolphins. It's quite remarkable how that little person, that young woman can control that big animal. But James says something that is so disturbing and is so sobering. But the tongue, no human being can tame. The tongue is uncontrollable. It's untamable. And boy, is that problematic. We're going to circle back. And then in the last few verses of what we read, it has to do with inconsistency. And we have that uh, statement in verse 9. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings. Uh, We've done that this morning. Uh, What a wonderful time of worship today. We were praising and lifting up God's name. Nothing beats that. But James is saying, if you've been lifting up God's name, how dare you tear down um, and destroy the name or the reputation of those who have been created in God's likeness? And let me say this, I hope you find it a little bit out there. You insult others, you insult God. It's a pretty strong motive for being careful with. We say, now, a curse, by the way, here doesn't mean that you put a spell on a person. A curse is more than just uh, expletives directed to another person. It really is this idea of tearing down other human beings. And James here doesn't give us a list. We might go, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a list? But we can assume from other parts of Scripture, he's thinking of gossip, he's thinking of slander, lying to people. The list can go on and on and on. But as I've studied this passage, an insight leaped off the pages of Scripture. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. What about when we tear down ourselves? Uh, I have for years been fascinated with an area called self-talk. I've tried to incorporate some of the theory into my counseling. Uh, Some of you who have any counseling or psychology experience might recognize the name William Backus, who wrote the famous book, Tell Yourself the Truth. And let me assure you, A lot of people, even Christians, struggle big time in this area. We tell ourselves lies or what it gets labeled uh, unbeliefs about who we are and what we represent. I'm dumb. I'm never going to amount to anything. And we can get into a spiral of negativity, a bold statement... Show me someone who struggles with depression or struggles with anxiety. There's a lot of other factors, but at certain points, there's a struggle with self-talk. And I would suggest that at various points, all of us can struggle in this area. We need to identify the lies that we tell self. And we need to have, as Paul says, an accurate estimation of who we are. Not too high, but God forbid that it's too low. Too, too low. You say, right, John, are you suggesting that I talk to myself? Yes. And I'm also suggesting that you have an inner dialogue that's going on all the time. Now, sometimes that 
inner dialogue is expressed out loud and other people hear it. But you need to identify it. But when you do go out loud, and I'm going to suggest that some of us who are close to someone who struggles in this area needs to feel, your, I'm giving you permission to correct them. To say, that's not true what you're saying about yourself. That's false. That's a lie. Our, our enemy, right? The source of the evil tongue is called the father of lies. He's the accuser. He loves, he loves it when you're having negative self-talk. He, he delights in it. He just loves to fire it up. Keep, keep putting yourself down. Come on, keep doing it. And that is not God's way, not for a second. A few years ago, Lauren Daigle, a Christian artist, wrote a song, and I wondered why it was so popular, why uh, all over it just uh, was a, a big hit. We've sung it a couple of times here. You know the song, You Say? I love the words, and I'm just going to give them to you quickly. Lauren Daigle writes, I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. And you say I am held when I'm falling short and when I don't belong. You say, I am loved, and I believe. I believe what you say, and I will believe. The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. In you, I find my worth. I find my dignity. If you struggle in this area, my best suggestion to you, listen to Lauren Daigle a few times, but go to God's word. Read through Ephesians chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 8. I can give you a lot of other passages. You need to give that positive enforcement to yourself through Scripture. What God thinks of you. You need to go out of here today with your head held high. No, I'm not saying we all stumble. No one's perfect. No one has arrived here at Byron Community Church. But we need to have that proper evaluation of self. The last couple of illustrations, James just points out the incompatibility. His two illustrations are intended to be answered no. Um, The salt water, the fresh water, the idea of a fig tree bearing olives. No, that's just not the way it should be. There needs to be that consistency of uh, who we are and what we do and what's coming out of our mouth. So the tip... There is a tension, isn't there, between what James says in James chapter 1. Keep a a tight rein on your tongue. Control it. Then in the same breath, James is saying in chapter 3, it's uncontrollable. But did you notice that little phrase? No human being can control the tongue. And by God's help and with his grace, we are able to control the tongue. Jesus, in Matthew 12, gives us a whole other perspective. He says that the tongue reveals what's going on in the inside. And you need an inside renovation that will impact what you're saying. You can struggle a lifetime trying to correct your speech and get control of it. Jesus says, I want to change your heart. And if you're a believer, I'm going to continue renovating your heart, and you will see the reward and the blessing. Final words, benediction from Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen? Let's try, with God's help and by his grace, to use our tongue, our speech, and our words for God's glory. Amen? Stand up for our final song, please.